Good afternoon, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, yes. Blues in the spirit. Blues in the spirit. All right, I'm gonna get us I'm gonna get us started on our 215 panel, what the music says, you know, intersections between hip hop, hip hop and the blues. Uh, my name is Gil Cook. I'm a English professor here at Dominican University. I just finished my second year. Um, even though my field is English, I do a lot of research in cultural studies that includes hip hop studies, amongst, amongst other things. And uh, when I first came to campus and Janice found out about my work and some of the publishing I had done and stuff like that, she automatically sort of came to me about the Blue Symposium and was telling me about some of the things that she envisioned for doing with what would become the symposium that we're at right now. And she was saying to me, you know, like I want to bring in some of the, the sort of academic intellectual discourse that's going on in some of the music studies fields. And particularly, she said it'd be great if you were to do something where we would bring in hip hop and, and talk about it in relation to the blues. So this panel comes, this panel comes out of that. Uh, I'm going to basically be serving as moderator today and sort of timekeeper if you will, I'll, I'll say a few things about our panelists, talk about how the panel came together, you know, say a few words about the blues and hip hop, and then I'm gonna just leave it to the brilliant minds of Symbol to do the rest. Uh, this is gonna be our most sort of conventional academic conference type of panel of any of the other panels. We're all academics, you'll, as, you'll see, as you'll see when I introduce us, so, you know. That's what, we're, that's what we're bringing to the table, and we hope it fits in with everything else that's sort of been the foundation has been laid for us with the rest of this great symposium so far. But uh, so first, first person that we're gonna have speaking today is gonna be Ernest Gibson, the intensely concentrated young man at the, at the end of the table there. Uh, Ernest is gonna be talking about blues and hip hop intersections as they, as they relate to issues of manhood. And so he'll be looking at James, uh, James, a James Baldwin literary piece and bringing the literature aspect into a discourse on hip hop and blues studies, right? From Ernest, we're gonna move on to Nick Krebs. Nick is a former student of mine. I did my graduate work at uh, Purdue University. That's where I got my PhD. Uh, Nick took a couple of classes with me when when I was teaching in the African American Studies Department, he is now my prized student of my life so far. You know what I mean? So far, so far. You know, he started a started started the American Studies graduate program at Purdue, working on his master's. Now, just finished his first year of his master's. You know what I mean? I'm happy to have him here. I'm excited. You know what I mean? Thank to you for having me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Going back to Ernest, because I didn't give him his just due. Ernest and I, um, Ernest and I also met at Purdue, where he did his master's, but uh, moved on to his PhD at University of Massachusetts Amherst, where he went on to procure a what's the name of the what's the name of the fellowship? Uh, the Thurgood Marshall Fellowship. The Thurgood Marshall Fellowship. That's right, dissertation fellowship at uh, at Dartmouth at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. I'm sure you've all I'm sure you all heard of it. He thinks he's special now. So he's, uh, he, just, he just signed it up. You know, he got a tenure track assistant professor position in English at Rhodes College in Memphis, Tennessee. So he's doing his thing. He's doing it. You know. <laughs> Is that Mark Anthony Neal in the back testifying? <laughs> no? All right. A little bit. Third after, third after we have Nick, we're going to have the incomparable Dr. <laughs> Stephanie Rose, who is actually a mentor of sorts of mine, whether she realizes it or not. When we, when we first met, we know each other from Purdue as well. We know each other from the National Council of Black Studies conferences that we both attend regularly. Uh, we're both, we both have chapters in, in a book together on Jay-Z and hip hop. So she's been a part of my life for a little while now. She's a, a bit of a fixture in my academic, in my academic career, in my academic life. You know, she came through for us on the symposium in other ways, in more ways than one. You know, that's Dr. Stephanie Rose. And then last but not least, my esteemed Dominican colleague of sorts, right? Robert Hansard, <laughs> you know what I mean? Dr. Dr. Robert Hansard recently completed, successfully completed and defended his dissertation for his PhD. So 
you know, we have a lot of we have a lot of professoriates sitting up in front of the room right now. Steph is currently in the English in the Women. the women women's and ethnic studies departments at the University of Colorado at Colorado Springs. So yeah, this was this is the the young lions that I assembled for the purposes of talking about hip hop and blues intersections. So I hope you guys I hope you guys enjoy it. So I can I think we'll just we'll just get right to it. The Sounds of New York Absurdity, James Baldwin's Another Country and the Bluesing of an Empire State of Mind. I begin with an epigraph that should ring familiar to most of us in this room. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these, the homeless tempest tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. Emma Lazarus, New York City, as a geographical and cultural space occupies a very unique position within the national narrative. In being centered within a discourse of opportunity, mobility, and achievement, it distinguishes itself from other major urban centers. For many Americans and their international brethren, however, it signifies a constantly negotiated duality, one that paradoxically represents the light and darkness of this nation, its blue story, if you will. This is largely due to the fact that the Big Apple always and already holds the promise of paradise or the potential of hell and dares its residents or sojourners to try their endurance in that exhaustive and existential dance with Lady Liberty. For African-American New Yorkers, the city has never been characterized by the symbol of welcome gifted by the French in 1886. Even amidst nominal success, the history of race relation has assured a tenuous relationship between black New York and that perfectly carved Statue of Liberty. For most, historically, her Book of Laws, Elevated Torch, coupled with Lazarus's inscription, Petitioning for the Downtrodden, illuminate Americans' mocking gesture of oppression and the absurdity of the New York cultural space. Nevertheless, those who have triumphed over the absurd past paint the city with a nostalgic romanticism, while others see how the sounds of New York strongly echo the blues of Africa America. This paper seeks to show how the tragic narrative of James Baldwin's Another Country departs from the celebratory narrative witnessed in Sean Carter's Empire State of Mind and how the subsequent bluesing of African American identity within the country's most populated metropolis nuances the ways in which one imagines and reimagines New York as a cultural and racial space. In February of 2009, Angela Hunt and Janae Sewell Upet crossed the ocean and took a trip to London. During that summer, personal and familiar sickness pushed the women into a nostalgic longing for the American home space in general and New York City in particular. According to Hunt, quote, we said to ourselves, we complain about so much about New York, about the busy streets, about the crowds and the pushing, about the subway system, but I would trade that for anything right now. Before we left the hotel that night, we knew we would write a song about that city, end quote. While the song was meant to serve as a mediated form of catharsis through musical expression, it would later be sent and picked up by one of the foremost leaders of hip hop in the hip hop generation, Sean Carter, better known as Jay-Z. Jay-Z, also a native New Yorker, who grew up in the same building as Hunt at 560 State Street in Brooklyn, instantly appreciated the song and after changing the lyrics, but maintaining the hook, transformed it into one of the most successful singles of the year. Eventually, the orchestral rap ballad, as it is often deemed, would feature Alicia Keys on vocals and chorus, also a New York um, native, and sample Stacey Lattisaw's 1968 rhythm and blues hit, Love on a Two-Way Street. <coughs> the song Empire State of Mind would go on to top numerous musical charts and win a significant number of awards, including Best Rap Song, Song Collaboration, and Best Rap Song at the 53rd Grammy Awards. Part of the song's allure, aside from a dexterous lyrical performance by hip hop's philosopher King, and soaring vocals from the musical darling of New York City, stem from the odic exaltation of New York City proper. As Jay-Z weaves the historic landmarks in with very spe uh, specific cultural markers, he captures the grit and grime of the New York experience, particularly as it relates to black and brown bodies. However, it is Key's commanding voice in the chorus that cements the song's seductiveness. She sings, quote, New York, I can't sing, so I won't sing. <laughs> <laughs> Concrete jungle with dreams are made of. There's nothing you can't do. Now you're in New York, 
These streaks will make you feel brand new. Big lights will inspire you. Let's hear it for New York, New York, New York, end quote. Empire State of Mind, when read and studied closely, complicates the black New York experience by couching the absurdity of New York within a narrative of triumph. Both Jay-Z and Keyes, while intimately familiar with the dark storied past of African Americans in the city, now rap and sing a very different sound, one that, if she could speak, would fall from the very lips of the Statue of Liberty. New York's new hip-hop anthem thus, while drawing attention to the very real existential plight, reinforces the mythology surrounding the city, and with sound replete with rhetoric of dream, hope, and big lights, silences the very real blues experience of people of color. Almost 50 years before America witnesses the Empire State of Mind, James Baldwin published his third novel, Another Country, and changed, for some people, the way we understood the big American city. Chronicling the tragic fate of a jazz musician by the name of Rufus Scott, the novel represents an anachronistic bluesing of the Empire State of Mind and exhales a very different sound than the descendants who were to follow. The first portrait of Rufus Scott is one of aimlessness and destitution. Through the use of flashback, Baldwin outlines how Rufus arrived at his current state, and by taking the reader back to Rufus's last performance as a mem member of a jazz band, he captures the moment where the drummer's life began to change, as well as the subtle question that pervades the novel. This is done through another member of the ensemble, a young saxophonist who used his instrument to speak to the audience, to the world, and more importantly, to Rufus. Listening to the young man as he assumes a solos, solo, Rufus observes, quote, he stood there, wide-legged, humping the air, filling his barrel chest, shivering in the rags of his 20-odd years, and screaming through the horn, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? This, anyway, was the question Rufus heard, the same phrase unbearably, endlessly, and variously repeated with all of the force the boy had, end quote. The vocal musicality in this moment foreshadows Rufus's journey through the rest of book one and through the memories of the other characters of the novel. The saxophonic question of love and Rufus's ability to understand it are symptomatic of his own struggle with love, with the prospect of being alone in the cold new world cultural space and the blues reality of his own life. Baldwin paints this cultural coldness again through the figure of the saxophonist in noting, and I quote, and yet the question was terrible and real. The boy was blowing with his lungs and guts out of his own short past, somewhere in that past, and the gutters are gang fights or gang shads in the acrid room on the st sperm stiffened blanket behind marijuana or the needle under the smell of piss and the precinct basement he had received the blow from which he would never recover and this no one wanted to believe. Do you love me? End quote. The description of the boy's past, whether imagined by Rufus or will in nature, testifies to the blues reality for many black men coming of age in the New York environment. The advocation of violence, allusion to repugnant sexual practice, reference to abuse of drugs and criminality, and representation of filth all coalesce into a portrait of destitution that strongly parallels Rufus's being during the first eight pages of the novel. In this regard, the saxophonist becomes metonymic for a more general community, his story a signifier for a blues people. Rufus's struggle with loneliness and the longing to be loved materializes in a variety of different relationships. Baldwin's intention, I argue, is to use these different relationships in order to magnify the germ of his dilemma. While the act of asking the proverbial blues question, do you love me, is significant, the reader is also forced to wonder, to whom exactly is he asking this question? In asking this and daring to answer it, honestly and responsibly, the reader understands Rufus's loneliness as not some abstract feeling of alienation that can be experienced by a random individual feeling lost in an overwhelming world. Instead, his loneliness is decidedly racial. It is the product of a social environment intolerant of his blackness. In a sense, Rufus is at war in the very land he calls home, feels disconnected and rejected from the very space that ought to be his sanctum, right? This is sound familiar from the Blues Divas talk yesterday when Deidre mm. was talking about how this is our music and I feel like a stranger in my own industry. This is Rufus's blues. By stumbling into this particular consciousness of being, he experiences a crisis in his manhood where all he knows and loves about himself is attacked from multiple angles. And from a Camusian perspective, think Albert Camus, this signals his exposure to the absurd. For, quote, in a universe suddenly divested of illusions and lights, man feels an alien, a stranger, 
His exile is without remedy since he is deprived of the memory of a lost home or the hope of a promised land. This divorce between man and his life, the actor and his setting, is properly the feeling of absurdity, end quote. Mm. Um, Rufus's feeling of the absurd, earlier hinted towards through his ability to relate to the saxophonic question of love, crystallizes into more concrete interracial moments where his blackness, the core of his manhood, is literally attacked, questioned, or conveniently ignored. When Baldwin begins Another Country, he paints a very dark or blue picture of Rufus and carries the reader into a confrontation with the drummer's objection. Within the first 50 pages, we learn that Rufus is, quote, one of the fallen, one of those who had been crushed on the day which was every day these towers fell, end quote. We learn that the first character we meet, again, Rufus, is, quote, entirely alone and dying of it, end quote. We learn of his strained relationship with the white world, of his inability to deal with or make sense of or survive the racial intolerance and absurdity that has led him to literal and metaphoric homelessness, where he must prostitute himself for food and warmth and shelter. In essence, we learn quite early what makes this figure tragic, what makes him blue. But then there's a moment where we hope, just as Rufus hopes, where we see the possibility for redemption, where our spirits warm at Rufus's revolt against the racially absurd as he conjures the strength to visit, even in his debased state, even in his blue state, his friend Vivaldo. Our fingers might be shaken as we turn the pages. As Baldwin's authorial genius turns us from readers into spectators, we can hear Bessie Smith as Rufus hears her singing on Vivaldo's phonograph. We can feel his hurt, his pain, his plea, the dissipation of light in his darkest hour and his silent call to his friend in the world, that saxophonic question of love, do you love me? It is here that Baldwin's novel becomes a blues story where Rufus becomes a blues man. And Baldwin yeah. captures the intersection of his character and the blues in writing, quote, there's thousands of people, Bessie now sang, and got no place to go. And for the first time, Rufus began to hear in the severely understated monotony of this blues, something which spoke to his troubled mind. The piano bore the signal witness, stoic and ironic. Now that Rufus himself had no place to go, cause my house fell down and I can't live there no more, Basie sang. He heard the line and the tone of the singer, and he wondered how others had moved beyond the emptiness and horror which faced him now, end quote. From the muddy melancholia of Mississippi and Memphis, to the profound sadness of sharecroppers, from the musical testimonies of traveling builders and railway layers, to the deep emotionality of singers in Chicago, the blues uproots itself from the shackles of the South and the heartache, heartbreak of the Midwest and travels um, north and east to texture the sound of Baldwin's Harlem. We learn in Rufus's hearing of Bessie is that the blues is much more than music. It always and is already like the spirituals that predated it and the jazz and hip hop that are to follow an expression of black and blue experience. Whereas Jay-Z's empire state of mind would have one believe it possible to fluidly dance with that beautiful statue symbolizing freedom, Baldwin's narrative reminds us that as black and brown bodies, even in New York City, we are more likely to dance to the sound of New York's absurdity with the empress of the blues in our head and Lady Liberty fading in our back. <laughs> the ending of book one can be punctuated with Bessie's blues song, Nobody Knows You When You're Down and Out, and with Rufus on the George Washington Bridge. The last we hear from Rufus's character, his last blues song, is the echo of the jazz saxophonist and his blue sentiment, a deep questioning of the world and of God. Quote, you bastard, you motherfucking bastard. Ain't I your baby too? He lifted himself by his hands on the rail, lifted himself as high as he could and leaned far out. The wind tore at him, at his head and shoulders while something in him screamed, why, why, end quote. With 87 pages, Baldwin offers his protagonist to suicide. In less than nearly one-fifth of the novel, the reader witnesses a man's descent from that hopeful and bright empire state of mind to the blues man's and blues woman's tragic expression of life. Now, let's hear it for New York, New York, New York. Well, let us hear it as Baldwin heard it, through the voice of Bessie Smith, deep, black, and blue. Thank you.
Thank you, Ernest. We'll just move on to Nick. Thank you, Ernest. Yeah, that was really great. Uh, really, there's going to be some correlations here, I think, between all of our papers, which I think is going to be very beneficial for the audience and also our discussion afterwards, which I hope is very fruitful. I want to thank you all for coming out and having a great audience throughout the whole symposium. Thank you to Janice and Gil for having me and everything. What I want to talk about today is it's kind of actually I want to start with the empire state of mind that you talked about and the bluesing of the mind. And I want to talk about the African unconsciousness and the idea of Afrocentricity and where this diasporic movements, these diasporic musics come from. If blues is black music, there's more than just blues that is black music. There's black music that has influenced cultures around the world for centuries, for hundreds of years, for thousands of years. There's black music that has influenced every single civilization and every form of music and art that we know and enjoy today. So one of the things that I want to talk about specifically is, is this idea that um, Edward Bruce Bynum comes up with in his book, The African Unconsciousness. And what he talks about is this idea of a mother tongue of language. So if, if all of, of human existence as we know it originates in certain forms and certain settings over time spreads and changes, there are, there are mother tongues. There's a language that constructs and, and, and connects all of us. I think that goes to say with music as well. And, and my argument here is that basically the mother tongue of music is black music. It is diasporic music. It is diasporic peoples. And it is the bluesing of that understanding of music that is then crossed over and transcribed into dominant mainstream. So there's this twofold issue, I think, in the Afrocentric unconsciousness or the, the focus of um, diasporic music and people. And there's the aspect of the origination, the blues, the black music. The, and then there's the appropriation issue that we've been talking about a lot, specifically yesterday in some of the panels. And where this goes to for me is three points. So there's the blues, there's block parties, and there's benga. And this is gonna, this is gonna span the time from the blues up until 2012 today, what we're talking about right now. So what I wanna say is there's the blues, that's the original, that's diasporic music, that's when we really see it come to a forefront and into a genre that then gets appropriated, right? You have jazz, you have swing, you have soul, you have funk, you have all the way up to hip hop. We have hip hop, we have block parties going around. We have a celebration and atmosphere. I like how some of the panelists, especially yesterday in the plenary session, started to talk about not just the blues and the effect of understanding the historical legacy, but the space of celebration, the opening of time, bringing people together, the communal aspect. That communal aspect to me is, is one of the most important parts of not only hip hop, but any form of diasporic music. You're creating a space where people can come together. They can not only reflect on the history that we have, the history that we need to be aware of, but more importantly, the celebration and the time and the, the struggle that they have overcome, or some have overcome to some today, and where we can go in the future. So when I was in Harlem in 2009, I was on a research tour with the Black Cultural Center from Purdue University, and I had the chance to speak and uh, dine with Cool DJ Herc for um, over a period of two days for a couple hours. It was an amazing experience. If you don't know who Cool DJ Herc is, he's basically the godfather of hip hop. He introduced cutting a record, he introduced block parties, and he threw the original ones on Cedric Avenue with you know, birthday parties, things like that. And what Herc said is it's not about the money, it's, it's about community, it's about aspects, it's about bringing people together. It's about the space, the space of the block party. And to me, that space becomes a temporal thing. If, if you have a record and it's playing and it's James Brown and everyone's bumping and everyone's enjoying it, okay, and you start cutting that back and forth, you're not only changing the music, but you are changing the time. You are expanding that break, that drum beat, that space of happiness, that space of celebration, that space of, hey, we've overcome this, this struggle. And right now, for the next 30 seconds, for the next 45 seconds, for the next two hours, is now DJing concerts. They're crazy when you go see a DJ set now. It is two to three hours of music, and they are constantly mixing and moving the same kind of back and forth, like you know, bumping beat, right? Drum break beat. That time space there has enabled a community to one come together to talk about their history, their lived experience, and make it aware, and then also celebrate in a space, in a time that they control. They have complete access and control over in the cutting. The DJ himself is controlling that space. That to me is something that is, is very important. So block parties take the blues, they take the aspect of diasporic movement, the social movements, right? They have this whole historical combination. They take that and they pick it into a space where now we have an influence over it and a complete control of the celebratory aspect. So when you have hip hop moving into the 20th century, or the 21st century, excuse me, you have a, an innovation in technology, you have the advance of laptops, the, the internet, you have this space where now crossing over into the mainstream happens like that. As soon as there's a new artist somewhere, it's already downloadable by someone in South Africa, and someone in China, and someone in New Zealand, and someone in New York, and someone in West Lafayette, Indiana. That's how I can get my music from, the, you know, from in England. And let's be specific here, I'm gonna start talking about Benga. So Benga is an artist. 
He uh, originally, his family is from West Africa. He grew up in South Croydon, London, which is a cultural center, part of an area where there's a lot of um, live clubs and music. When he was 11 to 12, he started going into record companies and getting records, getting individual samples. So he wasn't doing, I'm going to go get you know a record here and I'm going to have my laptop and I'm going to press play and I'm going to press you know make you some music. No, Bango was going in just like the original hip hop DJs, just like Mix Master Mike, just like the people you hear interviews with. They were combing. They were going into the basements and I want this one horn sample. I want to bring this part. I want to come back and get this. I'm going to put it on a table. I'm going to spin it. I'm going to have that scratching noise of the vinyl and I'm going to have this other sample here and I'm going to conglomerate it and make their own practices. By the time he's 14, this is Bango. In London, he's now playing in clubs. He's now a producer. He has a couple other people with him that are producing a sound. Now they're not just, you know, from West Africa and living in London. There's there's white coal miners that are a part of this. There are other types of immigrant communities that have found and formulated a community here. And what I'm talking about now is, is called dubstep. Okay, so this is a music industry, or not an industry, excuse me, but a genre that has instantly crossed over into the white mainstream. There was no period of underground. I mean, th there is a, a year span there, but what happens is this ability, this um, connection between hip hop and sampling and controlling the blues and having a celebratory atmosphere has now changed into an instant digital revolution. So Benga's 11 to 14, right? This is in the, the late 90s, very early 2000s. He begins producing, he begins spinning records, he begins creating and having his sample library, having his other friends. They're using live drums when they are recording. They're constantly spinning on vinyl. They're not doing what the American DJ scene is doing. They are cutting back and forth. All the wobble noises and the craziness and the, the um, sounds that I'd say the modern um, mature generation as we've described them don't necessarily like that the youth are listening to that change between generations of musical interest, that was produced by actual manipulation of an instrument that wasn't produced by just a computer. But here in America, that mainstream crossover issue has already been absorbed. So what Benga is able to do here is I, I think that he's taking the idea of Cool DJ Herc. Cool, De cool Herc, like I said, you know, is all about the space and expanding that and having that control over that aspect. Benga does the same thing. Benga also is aware of his diasporic relationship. His um, album covers, he has two that I'm very, very particular about. One is Pleasure's EP. It's a five or six track EP. Came out in about between 2005 and 2007. I've, I've seen a couple numbers there. And it focuses basically um, a comedic profile shot. So it's an all white background with his profile tilted. He's got the angle and it's solid black color on a white background again, right? So in his first major album release, which then um, was a 2008, it's called Diary of an Afro Warrior. It again features an all white background with a black comedic profile shot. This time though, there's an angle change. So instead of seeing it as a, a straight side profile, you see it from below, almost in the sense that he has now raised himself to a pedestal after he has international acclaim and some sort of success. Now that, that success and, and claim there comes from an instant, again, like I said, instant crossover because of this digital revolution. He's instantly being downloaded, not only in London, not only in Europe, not only you know, in Asia, but here in America. And so that brings this, this new international form, this new um, evol evolved form of diasporic music and black music and blues music into a new future with a digital revolution. And for me, this, this ties specifically to not only the African unconsciousness, the empire state of mind, and the bluesing of the mind, because Benga has this fusion here, but it, it really speaks also to the mother tongue of music, like I was saying. So if we have this um, difference between Afrocentric thought and the idea of where we are coming from and where our language is coming from and where our music is coming from and where our culture is coming from and where we as a people are coming from and where we're going to move from tomorrow, because we're not talking about just you know 1960 to 2000 or you know 1895 to 2000. We're talking about 270,000 years ago to 2012. That time experience there, that's that's a diasporic influence. That's a diasporic culture. That's a diasporic production that has been completely undervalued. And one thing that I think is important is is to see this transmission and this transgression from not only the blues to the jazz, soul, funk, all the way through hip hop, but now how the mass media it's it's just being absorbed again by the mainstream. And with that, there's a couple little samples that I want to I show to kind of introduce this music and talk about. And um, after that, I want to get back more into just actually examining the music a little bit, talking more about the, um, the polyrhythmic structure, the live drum samples, and the actual manipulation of that. So these, these are all four tracks from Benga. He produced them and then mixed them. And I will... Uh, really quickly, you'll have about 45 seconds to 30 seconds on each track.
polyrhythmic structures and sounds. So the idea of non-circular time, non-linear time, and non-Western constructions. So when I'm playing drums myself, when I'm playing beats, I'm using rhythms, I'm using a, a dominant time signature, and I'm you know, mathematically creating something over that. If you look at the foundations of, of our music, if you look at the foundations of what I'm going to be arguing is diasporic music, is diasporic influenced music, it's not linear. It's circular. It uses overlapping different types of rhythms. So the first track I played for you, that's hand recorded drums, that's live polyrhythms, and that's something that is not Western and is not you know, England or American. And he's bringing that into a mainstream aspect. The second track is just electronic production where he's created the sounds on a computer and sampled them. The third one, again, is live drums. So he's playing a trap set in that case, but he's still using different types of overlaying polyrhythms, okay? And the last track, it's just a mashup between a song that he has made and you know, a rap lyric. And the interesting thing about this, to, to wrap up everything, is when I saw Benga and Scream live, they came over here to the United States in Chicago, actually in the Congress Theater a couple weeks, well, it was about a month ago. Their whole atmosphere is a block party, and this is what turned me on to it. When Cool Day DJ Herc says it's about the time and the space, and you have you know, seven or eight DJs, they're all stopping, they're cutting, they're talking to the crowd, they're involving it, they want you to get hyped up and jumped up. They have one MC the whole time who's not rapping, He's not talking about you know, his cars and his money. No, 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 he's, he's talking about the crowd, the involvement. This is us together. This is our community. This is our space. Are you guys having a good time? I'm having a good time. Are we having a good time? <laughs> and that aspect of celebration, I think, comes from the space of recognizing and appreciating the origin, the blues, the black music, the diasporic music and culture, and then being able to have the space to one, not only appreciate, but celebrate. That's what I got for you today. Thank you. Waiting, waiting in a jungle's quicksand, he struggles to stand, staring stalemate into a fate of oblivion. Not knowing he would survive longer, just being still. I, I want to heal, reach down and rescue him, but holding on too tight, I just might choke the breath the life he clings so frantically to. 114 blocks south of Madison's concrete gardens, west of Pullman Porter's utopian borders, he is a stilettoed rose, growing amidst broken glass dreams and cluttered gutter streams, wasting away like semen caught in the bellies of used condoms. 
I want to cradle his underweight 11-year-old body in kisses, but you suggest this won't make a man of him soon enough. See, to survive this life, little man's got to be tough, and he can't learn to cry because he might die watching bullets fly. He is running and running and running from what to try, buy, and the lies of predators. Hunting season is open, and lions are going after their own. This is our song. I wrote that poem for my nephew when he was 11 years old. He told me when he was eight that he didn't care if he went to jail because his cousins and his uncles were there. He's 19 today and is currently in Cook County Jail. And I want to, I, uh, I have a paper prepared, but you know, this is not that kind of conference. And when it's, <laughs> <laughs> when it's not that kind of conference, you go with the synergy of what is happening. And there has been a lot of synergy um, thus far. And building off of that, dealing with representations or moving beyond what has been talked about from the beginning of the symposium yesterday, um, this morning from the keynote speaker, Zandria must have been in, um, there must have been something in the spirit and in the waters because the very first line of the paper that I, I've written is when the sultry voice of Erica Badu begins to moan, mm -hmm. brothers got this complex occupation. Mm -hmm. There must be something going on in terms of the kind of conversation and the discourse that we have come together to have. And so thinking about why um, we are in this space and building off of what Dr. Gibson, <laughs> I, I have to do that now because um, he just finished, his, it's appropriate and he just you know finished his PhD. So when we think about a James Baldwin to a Jay-Z constructing space as black men within the United States and their perspectives, there are some serious questions that come up, particularly when we think about Leroy Jones, now Amira Baraka, who talks about a blues aesthetic having to be connected to the political historical and social lives of the people that have created the blues. Mm -hmm. And so that we can't look at a blues aesthetic that is depoliticized, and many people have said throughout this symposium that blues music is black music. And what that means when we try to disconnect it from black experience articulates a primacy or a focus on white supremacist ideology in the United States. And we have to be able to raise those questions when we think about a blues aesthetic as well as the continuum that Nick then begins to talk about a black aesthetic of African people in the Americas. Because Amir Baraka is very clear that black people in America are Western people. Mm -hmm. And we have to be conscious of that, uh, not just in a double conscious kind of state as um, Du Bois talks about, but we have to be very specific that black people in the United States are Western people mm -hmm. and what that means. And so my talk raises questions about black popular representations of masculinity that are often characterized as state-constructed violence, state-articulated criminality, and social deviance, and what that might mean for representations of black masculinity that allow for students to ask me in class, well, you know, it really was the hoodie, wasn't it, when Trayvon Martin gets shot? And don't you think that rappers have something to do with it and gangsters? And I have to respond, gangsters to me wear $3,000 suits. <laughs> and they operate on Wall Street and it, at NATO and uh, different, but you know. Um, <laughs> so within the matrix of what Zandria spoke about earlier, 
and being very clear when I articulate that we cannot be romantic revisionists of history when we begin thinking about representations of, of black womanhood and we can't just disconnect ourselves from the Nicki Minaj's or whatever, totally um, depoliticizing what might be operating in the space or the cultural historical moment at this time that allows for a Nicki Minaj to exist. I want to, I want to, on the flip side, when we think about black masculinity mm -hmm. and those representations of black masculinity that allow for us to criminalize current popular representations of black manhood in the United States, whether it's through a Jay-Z or Lil Wayne or um, Waka Flocka, whomever, <laughs> you know, um, that we cannot be in a space that totally condemns nor fully embraces that, but we have to make it problematic and we have to, it, it, because it's complex. And it's also historically connected, meaning that the very existence for someone to articulate themselves as African American or black American is deviance, is criminal behavior articulated by mainstream and dominant cultural practices. So when we look at resistance, when we look at um, the idea of what deviance is, the very fact that we have black people creating is and has been historically constructed as criminal behavior. We, we don't get a Phyllis Wheatley without criminality. We don't get an Alada Equiano without criminality. We don't get a Frederick Douglass without criminality because they weren't supposed to read and write. The laws and the social customs of that moment of that time dictated and did not allow for those practices to happen. So they were deviant in the very fact of being and challenging those dominant structural norms. But I also want to honor the time because there's only so much you can say in 10 to 12 minutes, as well as um, create a dialogue afterwards or have time for a dialogue after. But I also want to make sure that I touch on why we can't fully condemn nor fully embrace because of the complexity of it all is the idea that we seem to not recognize the Americanness of masculine representation that happens within black bodies, but because of racial tropes or hierarchies or whatever, it becomes, the violence becomes understood in a particular way that is not read as this is really an American issue. This is a US issue that masculinity in the United States is constructed in a particular way, but because you are black, you don't get to do that kind of masculinity. Because you are black male, you don't get to perform masculinity in the ways that we understand self-madeness for New York or Empire State of Mind, right? You, that becomes complicated and um, marked as something odd and very different when F. Scott Fitzgerald does the same thing that a Jay-Z does in terms of hustling and using, um, creating these personas about oneself. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not suggesting that um, F. Scott Fitzgerald was quote unquote state regulated um, criminal, but the Rockefellers were. <laughs> The, I'm sorry, there, there, there are a number of representations within white masculinity that allow for their criminality to be celebrated, whereas the criminality or the violence or the deviance of black male bodies is read in a different context in a different kind of way. Um, and so the larger question that I've been noticing throughout this conference, even when, um, when we have artists that talk about, well, in this cultural tourism space, I need to be recognized, or I have a list of people to be recognized. The larger thing is, what is the structure in which we bow down to that allows for the standards to be created? And why is it that we invest in those standards 
why do we, as I've coined in other spaces, invest in the black market value of whiteness? Mm -hmm. And in doing a black market value, and, and I raised that issue because the brother Wayne um, Brooks yesterday talks about owning your own stuff. And holding on to that value system and that value structure that doesn't allow for you to throw a pity party when the award ceremony doesn't recognize you because you got your own stuff going on over here. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm getting the signal that 10 minutes goes really fast. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to stop and allow, and, and allow for the question final panel. Question yes. And answer. We're trying to get to question and answer. Yes. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, I too am uh, definitely honored to be able to uh, talk a bit about my research uh, with you and uh, uh, to uh, follow up on all the great presentations that we've had uh, thus far. Um, um, very interesting and exciting kinds of uh, conversations. Um, so my focus for my uh, discussion is just on drum voices and spirit power um, and the ways in which those kinds of things intersect with blues and hip hop, hip -hop in this sort of Atlantic context. Okay. Um, and uh, I mean, there's, there's a lot to that. Um, um, if you're beginning to say, can you connect blues and hip hop to specific West and West Central African kinds of examples? Why am I picking West and West Central African examples? Of course, because of the transatlantic kind of narrative of you know, 12.5 million or so people being brought in this kind of cultural exchange that the transatlantic contact uh, facilitates. Um, so, so why don't we see this connection um, as clear as maybe we could? I mean, what's at work there? Um, so I started out thinking about a quote by uh, Paul Robeson, where he says, um, um, at, and he's talking in 1935, but I think still some of what he's saying is relevant today. At present, the younger generation of diasporic descendants asks, what value, of Afri what, uh, value has Africa to offer the Western, that the Western world cannot give? Hmm. Um, and and he, he's, he's talking about that in light of these sort of problematic perceptions of Africa, the savagery, the devil worship, uh, witch doctors, the darkness, these kinds of things that have been taught quite you know, consistently in American schools. I mean, and this is beginning to change, obviously. Uh, um, but he also says, in these broken remnants was a mighty thing, something not destroyed but driven underground, leaving scars upon the earth's surface to mark the place of its ultimate reappearance. So I think that's a very important kind of place to begin to start. Um, to look at these kinds of potential connections. Uh, the drums in the West and West Central African examples, the voices coming via the oral traditions or the Abing or from the griots, um, the spirit power um, from the Obe, the Kung Fu or the Mayo, is it? Uh, the history and, and, and that sort of factor. So then can we figure this history into these kinds of understandings of drum, voice, and spirit power? And, and what does this kind of history set into motion? Uh, the kind of uh, ideas of resistance and culture. And, and then looking at blues and hip hop, using some of the artists particularly and some of their music to kind of bring some, some, some light into that. Um, uh, and of course, it, when you start talking about a black Atlantic or any kind of diasporic model, um, you come head on with the theoretical kinds of uh, discussions that have been had around this. Um, Paul Gilroy, for example, who describes the Blantic, black Atlantic as global or outer national and, and looks at the sort of amb ambiguity of I identity, right? Uh, the problematic intersections of the Enlightenment traditions and the black and African identity. Um, and these things kind of come out, for example, in Du Bois' uh, discussion of a, of a double consciousness. Or a Kwame Apia, who uh, says uh, and talks about this kind of idea of the third world versus the West. Um, to quote him, he says that the role that Africa, like the rest of the third world, plays for Euro-American postmodernism, like its better documented significance for modernist art, must be distinguished from the role postmodernism might play for the third world. And that begins to begin to deal with the complicated kind of questions that are at work when you're thinking about making these real strong connections between African sorts of origin points and their manifestations in the Atlantic world. Okay? Um, in, in Bell Hooks as well, because of the idea of, of uh, critical reexamination, revisioning, she says, the idea that there's no meaningful connection between black experience and critical thinking about aesthetics or culture must be continually interrogated. Okay? So are these, these are the kinds of things that are around this sort of uh, the theoretical questions, right? And it, it's taken us to some places, right? Uh, um, where do we end up? Uh, 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 so consider this, for example. I kind of argue that it's kind of two sides. And here's one side of this. 
Um, the essentialism, the cultural insiderism, um, and the myopic ideas of racial authenticity. Okay, and, and, and Wally Soninka rings right there for me with that. Um, he says, I'm crucially concerned with how the black man today exploits in his own interest the vacuum that has been created, concerned with how, in relation to that other world, he now cognizes and expresses his own being. Okay, so you can see the sort of questions that are being raised there. But this is one side of this, okay? And arguably, the other side of this is the sort of ethnic absolutism, the scientific reason, the racial domination, okay? Um, and for that, I look at a particular historic example, um, one that rings true. We're close, we're here in Chicago, right? We've got the uh, NATO's here and all that, right? Uh, so I think about the World Columbian Expo in 1893. Um, the White City, a demonstration of the city beautiful mo uh, movement, right? But something very interesting comes out of this event in 1893. Here is the strangest sight amongst all the spectacular wonders of the Pleiades. At one end are the Dahomeans, all lean and lank, all supremely hideous. Okay? Now, this is a very problematic kind of characterization, right? Um, the ideations of civil and uncivil, along the mid midway Pleiades long forgotten. So consider, for example, that they're making a film now about uh, H. H. Holmes, who of course was this very important kind of serial murderer who captured these people during the fair. But we've forgotten about the really kind of problematic categorizing of peoples and how maybe this influences whether or not people are identifying with this sort of African connectivity that's happening. Okay? In these wild people, we easily detect many of the characteristics of the American Negro. Uh, and, and in the cartoon that satirized this, right? Uh, um, it, it paid attention to this kind of question. Okay. Um, and of course, you have people like Ivy Wells, and that's why I put a picture there, as well as uh, um, others, who were very critical of what they saw at the fair. But we've long begun to forget, forget about this. Um, so does that mean, because of all these kinds of flaws, or these questions, I should say, around the black Atlantic, that we should just completely write it off? There's no way to come up with real tangible evidences that make the case for a strong connection between black identity and African, West African, specific kinds of examples of culture coming from via West Africa or West Central Africa. I'm always reminded of the quote by uh, Carl uh, Popper. He says, the criterion of scientific status is the theory of its falsifiability. In other words, um, if something, it's, it should be studied, it should be questioned, but it doesn't necessarily invalidate the importance of it. And even here, you have an example uh, of this sort of coming through of the voices via the oral traditions. Right? Um, oral traditions used in conjunction with other kinds of sources. Uh, field, uh, material, archival, the database, if you've ever heard of the slave trade database, you can actually begin to track the locations of slaves and their origins and where they end up, um, not just in Latin America, not just in the Caribbean, but also in North America. Right? And the beginning of the change in terms of how we are studying and understanding ourselves. If the archival evidence is flawed, if the database evidence is flawed, then we have to find other resources. It doesn't mean that the past, we just have to let it go. Well, we can't make that connection. Right? Uh, um, ethnomusicology, for example. Anthropo all these other kinds of new ways where we're beginning to look and to investigate the connection. So that's a kind of a centered kind of uh, element of my own research. So I use that to look at some uh, examples. Um, one of those being the, the djembe, or the talking drum, um, signified by the me, everyone uh, gathered together, right? Comes from the uh, Sudan or Sahil kingdoms, right? Bound up in this kind of vast rhythm of African history, right? Um, these states in the region of uh, Sudan, you can kind of see here on the map here, just kind of gives you an example of the location. Um, very important uh, um, in terms of uh, transferring and conveying these ideas of culture. Um, and even also, um, beyond the drum, looking at the Griot, uh, um, and the story of a very important king of the Mali Empire, one of these Sudanic states, um, the story of Sundiata is told through a Griot. He says, uh, and, and just check out the way he starts the story, okay, which I think is very, very interesting. I'm a Griot, a master in the art of eloquence. Right? Um, since time immemorial, the, the Cortez, or this family, have been in the service of Kiata princes of Mali. We are vessels of speech. We are repositories which harbor secrets many centuries old. Right? So he's beginning to get at this. 
Uh -huh. So can we say, well, here we are, way in Sudanic Africa, it's between the 10th and the 17th century. Is there any potential for this kind of connectivity? Right? What kinds of evidences can we look at? Well, you find, uh -huh. if I look at, for in particular, the Akan example, um, the long drum, or the dono, the talking drum, here's the same kind of drumming and the, and the, and the creation of the drum manifest and, and showing cultural exchange occurring in Africa initially. And that kind of cultural exchange in Africa sets up cultural exchange that's going to take place in the Americas via the transatlantic contact. Okay? So you see that in, in, in things like the abing, uh, uh, which comes from the asisibin, which is the talking horn, or again, the long drum, or the talking drum. You find these examples in the American sorts of uh, transatlantic experiences. Right? And the same thing can be said for the spirit power. Right? So what do we mean by spirit power? Well, I'm talking about traditional African spirit power. Okay? The Akonfo, the priests, um, coming from the Akan traditions. Um, the Kikango Mayala, which is this idea of one who rules, uh, um, bringing um, the sort of priestly power. Um, and then these, the Kunfu men, the Obe men, the Maya men, uh, empowering elements of Akan and Kikango culture and history for anti-slave reactions by maroon slaves and free blacks in the America. Not unlike what was happening in terms of resistance to invasion and enslavement in West Africa. Okay? And there are a couple examples, one being that of Adana Kepavida and the sort of Antonianism um, in the West Central African area. And if you know anything about this and um, the beginnings of this kind of movement, it starts out of a growing protest to the, the, the slave trade. I mean, the numbers of slaves who are being brought out of the Congo region go through the roof very quickly after the initial Portuguese contact. Um, and and it, it brings to light the, the motives of the missionaries who come to share the gospel. Uh, um, and, and, and some of the ideas and important elements that are conveyed up here. Um, the Congo across the Yo, a circular motion of the cosmos and the continuity of human life. Okay. Another example, um, a confinoche from the Akan tradition. Again, oftentimes we're viewing this through the prism of slavery. Right? And so um, we view this as perhaps uh, devoid of explored in historical intentionality. Big words to say, well, it doesn't show up in the archival evidence. It doesn't show up in, 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 the, in, in perhaps the, the letters or the writings. Because, you know, but why would it? If the oral traditions are the most important conveyances of these evidences, why would it, why would it really show up written down? And then because it's not written down, does that mean then, well, we invalidate it and we say we don't want to can't pay attention to this. Right? Uh, uh, so, I mean, he's existing in the literature only in the most mechanical sense. This is the idea. But if you go and ask and get the oral traditions, you get a completely different account. Kind of, uh, kind of, um, same thing with festivals and celebrations. In West Africa, for example, in Aquafem in Ghana, the Oham, the Ade, and the Adira festival observed and celebrated uh, in, in uh, this region. So you see the example of the celebration. And all these things show up. Um, in the Americas via the transit impact. This is just a quick view of the uh, database and just some of what you find. And I'll just say very quickly um, that you can see the regions I've been speaking of represent the top three in terms of places where slave populations, or captains I should say, are being brought to the Americas. The Gold Coast, um, by the Biafra, and West Central Africa, two of the regions I've talked about. Okay, but then so how does this manifest? How does the spirit power of these manifest? Well, um, for example, uh, Cujo's Maroons, um, creating and establishing a treaty with the British um, in 1739. A significant event memorialized in oral traditions carried down from the ancestors and widely known in Aquafunk town. So that's one example. Um, the Stono Rebellion, um, something that brings in the Bakango and Kikango kinds of ideas of Maya, okay, uh, 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 and slaves joining together. Different accounts discussing this in from different perspectives. The written evidence telling us one thing, the oral traditions, and an understanding of the sorts of cultures where these slaves are coming from, begin to provide us with another kind of uh, evidence. Okay. Um, and then in the celebration, here again, if you think about something like Joan Canoe, and this is uh, Isaac uh, Belisario's uh, picture from 1837, um, celebrating this very thing. And here you see the long drum, you see the abing, okay, and you see um, the gym. Okay. So there's some tra more transferability here than, than maybe we, we, we want to pay more attention to. Okay. Um, and, and so then how does this work in terms of blues and hip-hop? Right. Um, very quickly. Um, what kind of elements 
are, are factors in terms of what's happening politically and historically um, as blues is beginning. Like, think about the Nadir, 1877 to 1920. This is this period that they call the low point. Um, being this relationship that the federal government has with um, black people is at a low. Okay. Um, and, and, but one of the emerging or kind of counterpoints of this idea is, the, um, is black migration first. And with black, black, black migration are, of course, coming blues and jazz um, as part of these migratory and cultural intersections. Okay. And then from there, you know, looking at some quotes of some of the music that begins to, to speak to some of this. Um, for example, W.C. Handy. Who, who says, people are singing about everything. Trains, steamboats, whistles, sledgehammers, fast women, mean bosses, right? Everything, right? Um, but what does he say when he goes to the Mississippi Delta? Here's his musical activity. I saw the beauty of the music. It had stuff people wanted. It touched the spot. The music contained the essence, okay? So coming to a very important kind of idea. Um, also, too, um, as this sort of crossroads of the, the, the migration, because I went to the crossroads. Here again, we see the potential of the ideas of this kind of cross. Kind of coming up, because the crossroads mean something very interesting here. There's a spiritual kind of crossway that's at work there. Um, and so Robert Johnson's lyrics about the crossroad beginning to speak to that. Okay. And what about the hip-hop, right? Well, what are the sort of historical intersections there in the late uh, 60s, early 70s, right? You have a number of things, right? Um, the Gary, Indiana conference where you had all of the members of this sort of black power movement getting together to make plans and to do to figure out, well, what do we do next? Okay. Um, Jesse Jackson, for example, gives a very uh, great speech there, right? Um, great Society, the, these kinds of elements of the, of the uh, late 60s, or early 70s, right? Um, so how does that influence, then, the emergence of this sort of hip-hop um, art form, right? Um, how does hip-hop become this conduit for African-American culture greater than jazz? This is what uh, Henderson says. Um, we'll check out what uh, Karis one says. Over the years, it seems that I became a landmark in the hip-hop field of art, right? Um, I won't try to rhyme because I'm not getting a good cadence here, but uh, <laughs> I'll start because only Jaw will create it. Um, I'll just name it edutainment, this idea of hip-hop as a teaching tool, as a teaching resource, that kind of thing. Um, or again, the beginning to thinking of identity, the thinking of resistance, the thinking of culture. When I think about a song by Eric Lee and Rakim called In the Ghetto. He says, reaching for the city of Mecca, visit Medina, visions of Nefertiti, then I see him, mind keeps traveling. I'll be back after. I stop and think about the brothers and sisters in Africa. And they say, well, that's very simplistic. But it's a critical, it's beginning to ask the question. Okay? It's beginning to raise that up. And then last but not least, there's Calvin. Right? Um, and, and again, the questions of identity, the questions of resistance, the questions of culture coming into play. Uh, where he's basically talking about where has this music gone? Um, if it was meant to be, then it would be, because we relate physically and mentally. And she was fond of it. I'd be geek when she come around. Slim was fresh, Joe, when she was underground. Original, pure, untampered, and down sister. Well, I tell you, I miss her. He's talking about hip hop. So, very quickly, <laughs> that's my piece. Thank you. I'll let folks raise their hands with questions, and we'll just ask questions and let the panel answer. Please. I'm sort of old school, but I'm trying to understand hip hop. And mm -hmm. hip hop to me, um, I mean, I'm blues and verse, but hip hop to me is is exciting. And of course, I don't understand it, but I think you all really helped me, and I think probably others too, to begin to see the the value and the complexity because it's. Tendency, oh, hip hop, and they strip it, and they, I think there's more than one kind or whatever. And and so um, again, the complexity and to see the, the um, I, I can't find the words, but anyway. But one thing I wanted to ask, I can't remember your name. Um, um, is, is diaspora and this diaspora and sound that you're talking about? Is that a, jo a genre? Now, would you, like, lose itself? I, I mean, I would say we're going to any genre. So any form of cultural, what I'm trying to suggest is that there has been, over time, right, there's there's humans, and we exist, and there's interchanges of power. So some people, some humans have power, and some don't. And they've decided to oppress certain types of cultures, people, the victors write history. That's kind of how it's say. So th there's always an exchange. It's not just like the victors are the only ones learning something. You know, everyone is learning something. There's learning, there's exchanges from both types, top and bottom of the power structure. What I'm saying is, in any quarter of human history, there's been diaspora people, there's been marginalized people, there's been dominant people. They've exchanged information. Hold on, David. Sorry, Will. 
When we say when we say diaspora, there are several diasporas that we speak of, but in the context that we're talking about, we're talking about the African diaspora. Yeah. Diaspora, the Greek for dispersal, right? Oh, so yeah, we're talking. I teach, I teach that. Right. I mean, for the for the purposes of everyone in the audience, you know, not we can't assume everyone in the audience is an academic who understands black study speak. You know what I mean? But, uh, but we're talking about the formation of the, we're talking about the diaspora, we're talking about Africa as the point of origin during the execution of the Atlantic slave trade. Africans, mostly from Western and Western Central Africa, are dispersed to the parts of what we now know as the New World, the Western world. And we say that the various places that Africans are dispersed to, dispersal become the African diaspora. So if it's a geographical term, Right for the various places where Africans were sent during the execution of the slave trade. It's also a cultural term when we're talking about African cultures and their dispersal to other parts of the world because, of course, those Africans bring their culture with them. Right, so it's not just geographical, it's also cultural. It's also, so we're talking, when we're talking about diasporic music, we're talking about diasporic culture, we're talking about how these African influences via the slave trade get dispersed throughout the Western world and influence and become parts of those cultures. That's why Paul Gilroy makes the point, I forget who it was that brought up Paul Gilroy when he talks about the Black Atlantic. He says that the, like, the Western world, like the history of the Western world is bound up in the African contribution, Black contributions to the formation of that world because so much of that Western world was built as a result of the execution of the slave trade. So you can't speak of Africa and the Western world as though they're these mutually exclusive, unrelated things. Like they are mutually exclusive of one another's histories and cultural sort of developments of cultural reality, so on and so forth. Go ahead, Kuzi. Yeah, uh, has anyone looked up the Black origin of the word, Because in mm. In the in Tig language, uh, in, not, in northern Nigeria, we have a term called hipotaba, uh, which means philosophizing. So mm -hmm. is this related to it at all, or is that a different uh, origin of the that's not, that's not the origin that you hear in hip-hop, that you hear the word in hip-hop studies. Like you, you know what I mean? Like I, the, story, the story that I know of, of hip-hop comes from uh, from Buddha, oh, now of course I'm going to forget because I'm still on the piano, but the, 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 the Queensbridge, the Queensbridge crew of cats. Um, somebody help me out. Light skin, the light skin brother that always wears the, that, that usually has a ponytail. Queens, who's it? Is that who I'm talking about? I don't know who you are. No, 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 no. Right. I don't know who but no, Kuzi, but no, Kuzi, that's not that's not how that's not how we're taught. That's that's not how it's what, I've never heard that before. This is you saying this is my first time hearing it. What what's the origin of hip hop? What what's the meaning of the term? Hip hop. Like hip like hip hop in, in the sense of hip hop, it's like like that's such an impossible question to answer because so many different people so many different people claim that they coined the term hip hop. That's actually one of the sort of points of contention in hip hop is, is who coined the term, you know what I mean? And it's said to mean different things. It's said to just mean shit talk, you know what I mean? When you talk about philosophizing, you know what I mean? It's meant to make, it's, it's that, it's meant to mean resistance to sort of expression of a marginalized circumstance. It's meant to mean any of, it's meant to mean any of these things, you know what I mean? Like to pinpoint its origin, like that's, that's why I love the fact that you even introduced which you did into the discussion, because I've never heard that before, in terms of the origins of, of hip hop, the word. Like, I thought that it was, the way that it gets talked about, the way it gets argued over in hip hop studies is, you know, who was really the one that coined it, and where did it come from? I've never heard it attached to any particular, at least not in the hip hop studies discourses. There might be others in the audience. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 attached to a sensibility. Right, yeah. right. Musical. Right, and if you want to compare it with something else, compare the big band, the guys who wanted to stop playing their gig when they came from their gigs up town, they went out to this place called Metins, mm -hmm. and they played bebop. Right. So, 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 it's it's that so, so, so the reverse story is the story of uh, the end of um, soul, you know, the end of rhythm and blues, with it, which had a certain value, value cachet, that 
this allowed the young intellectuals, the young heads, so they could create their own worldview. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, if I could just jump in there. No. I would add to that, that uh, it's, it's unfortunate that no one would pay attention to the T kind of or, potential origin that's there. It could, I mean, who knows? But right. I mean, it could be there. I mean, and, and the same thing with the, with the griot or the oral tradition. No one's looking at that and saying, making the case that this is a starting. No, I shouldn't say no one. No, there are not a lot of artists who are doing that. Um, and, 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 and Gil, what you're saying is right. I mean, uh, Keras One has one way of saying what hip hop is. Yeah. Um, you can look at other artists; they have another definition of what hip hop is. So it just it varies from person to person, and it varies from people's experience that they're putting out in terms of the music, you know, in terms of what they're saying that it means. But I think, unfortunately, the, the, the sort of African origin point gets lost in that. But to that's me. the whole point: is unconscious, it's a cultural unconsciousness. It's a language that is older than we are. It probably does. It is a block. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Young people coming together, I, I like this to rap. Some of it's very real, yeah. you know, whether you like it or not. And I think, to me, that's really simple. It's mm -hmm. an unconscious. You always have it in your dreams. Mm -hmm. And it is. People philosophize. Mm -hmm. They work together. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense to me. Mm -hmm. And that is part of the dilemma of being black. You have no way to stuff from mm -hmm. And it has the origins, whether you speak Spanish or Portuguese, in its deepest sense in Africa. So that made sense to me. I thought, oh my, that makes sense. So we may say it comes from different things, but it's like the whole point. It is a kind of African collective unconscious. Right, but it's 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 Africa 2.0 though. You know what I mean? Like it's not like that's the root, that's the origin. But then what we're talking about is all of these sort of intercontinental right. exchanges, intercultural exchanges. Like they all get mixed into the pot and come construed and understood. That's what we now understand as blank. You know what I mean? So like, and I think that that's part of the difficulty with what we're, with what we're talking about now, is that these histories are now so intermingled and multiplicitous. Did you have, were you, was somebody else, was somebody else having a hand up? For five minutes, two more minutes? Let's get another question. There's a book that just came out, it's about the dozens, mm -hmm. by Lionel Wall. Mm -hmm. It's called Talking About Rap's Mom. Mm -hmm. It's the filthiest scholarly book you've ever read. <laughs> <laughs> recommended it just came out. No, there's there's that, that scholarship is out there. People are talking about hip hop as originating with just the, like I said, shit talking, shoot, you know, playing the dozens, getting back and forth with one another, you know what I mean? Like, you know, oh what you say about me, well then this, that, and this, then oh then what you say, which of course we can relate to the sort of call and response sensibility that we get from the blues when we talk about the blues. Like the in church and I mean like we can see these histories and their linkages. Yeah, that, that's a connection that's been drawn before without a doubt. I just want to say, Stephanie, I found that what you were saying was just fascinating. I wish I had not had it for 10 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it really made a lot of things click. I'm available for it. No, okay. <laughs> 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 I worked here in Dominican, and I'll be talking to Janice. I'll be talking to you again. But, um, but I really appreciate that. Because I think that do you have any papers that you've written about that particular topic? Actually, I do. And um, Jay Z, Hip Hop Philosopher King, it just came out, and and it's the collection that Gil was talking about, where we're both in um, the essay. So it does talk about representations of masculinity and black market whiteness. I'm sorry, I was rich at, at the risk of oversimplifying. Some some of the discussion yesterday was basically how black music and white people take it away, take away the mm -hmm. market, and all that shit goes on. And, and I, as I look at this as a white person, it just seems like this is just the natural progression of black music. I mean, you gospel music, jazz, swing, rhythm and blues, rock and roll, whatever. You know, black, the black energy moves it forward, moves creatively, creates it. White mm -hmm. people come in, take it, steal it. Conquer. And the next generation of black kids say, They have to come up with something. Screw that. I, I, I want to, you know. And it's just, it's like this, this motion of just pushing the black youth to something new and different, and then the white money, the white kids want to be like that, chase it, come after it, and I mean, honestly, I came in, I don't really care for hip hop, I don't know it, you know, but but I see this this timeline where it's almost, it's just like a natural progression. It's called heterogeneity. And in 20, in 20 or 30 years, some of the, some of the crap that I don't want to hear today is just going to be on the radio like everything else, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, I grew up in the 70s with funk. You know, I would, I would listen to funk. I, 
some little white kids listening to punk. My dad said, what that you listen to? And I said, probably just as crazy as when you were listening to swing to your parents from mm. Europe. You know what I mean? It's like this, it's this, this stereotype, whatever. And maybe that, to me, that's what I'm hearing. It's like this, the hip hop today is just that energy of a black youth saying, screw mm -hmm. this, I want to be different, I want to move out, I want to move it forward. And it, it, but it all, it's pulling the evolution of music forward. But, but and, I want to jump and in. And blues doesn't disappear. Blues is just yeah. over here. Can, can I jump in just very quickly? Along with that, though, is the very real economic piece, yeah. which, re which really is a horror space to talk about, and no one talks about it. So black people, people talk about it. Black people, black people have always been a trouble property mm -hmm. in their art. It's, it's property. Mm -hmm. that it's never really fully owned. Mm -hmm. So while we were pushed to create um, this young lady, and I just had a conversation about. Well, there were four elements of hip hop, and they're all mm -hmm. very commercial Rap, right now: mm -hmm. rap art, mm -hmm. break dancing, fashion. And DJ, DJ. Uh, and, and, and that's why you have to. They're all, they're all corporate. But you, you also have to recognize that within the paradigm, within the structure, or whatever, there, there's a disconnect between how. I, I, um, I have a colleague that teaches indigenous uh, thought, so indigenous philosophy or whatever. It's very problematic, and and I live in Colorado Springs. And for anyone that has looked up Colorado Springs, one of the landmarks is Garden of the Gods, right? And Garden of the Gods it was historically, still is, a sacred space for Native Indigenous people in the United States, but it's a national park right now. And there are plaques all over Garden of the Gods that says this was bought by so-and-so and so-and-so and, -so, and then given back to the state so that it can be a philanthropic space for everyone to come and enjoy. The idea is how do you want, like who did you freaking buy it from? <laughs> because, because within native indi or indigenous methods of thinking or whatever, there's no ownership of, of space, of land or whatever. So you have two forces um, impeding upon each other. The idea that, again, if you, if you go back to origin narratives about hip hop or whatever, many of the founding fathers of hip hop, and I put that in quotes or what, what have you, are very, yeah, exactly, but exactly. still, many many of them find um, it problematic that Sugar Hill Gang was the first to record yeah. because they didn't find value in what they were doing to be recordable and didn't see it as something like, who would want to record me um, talking over some tracks? So the idea of ownership was already different and the construction of how they were looking at creativity and what they were doing was different. And then there is an entity that comes in and says, I can possess this and it can be mine, and then I can sell it to someone else. And that, that's, that's what we are constantly in conflict with, are these competing hmm. ideologies and worldviews that don't necessarily agree with uh, one another. And so again, we have Garden of the Gods that somebody now owns as a state park, but it's somebody else's sacred space. And they're like, I don't know how you own it. Right. Sorry, that that's where we have to stop. We really wish we could keep going. Thank you for your participation. Thank you to the panelists. This is great. Thank you.